brief statement of what each of the documents that you referred to in the course of your statement is about. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, the first document that I read from was dated 1-21-1971 uh, to all agents from SAC Portland. The subject was FBI intelligence letter for the president and the code name for the program uh, was Inlet. And here, they, in the letter, they describe uh, a series of activities to provide for the president material that would be uh, to his interest and to provide him with meaningful intelligence for his guidance. And it's interesting to note that the type of information designed in paragraph 6 that they referred to may be obtained through investigations not wholly related to the security field. So that raises the question of what is the validity and the justification for these kinds of uh, activities. So I'm asking uh, what is Project Inlet? Who authorized it? Is it still in operation? Did it include political intelligence? And has the FBI ever gathered political intelligence? When and for whom? Do you have any idea of what Inlet's about? Any surmises, guesses? Well, I think that Project Inlet is a program of political intelligence and political surveillance of people in the country that I think is unlawful and unconstitutional. What do you mean by political surveillance? Well, that means that you're surveilling people on the basis of their political thoughts and their... Um, uh, positions that they've stated publicly. This could be uh, a civil rights organization, a uh, group of minority persons protesting uh, their plight in society, maybe a group of anti-war uh, people who we now clearly know have been thoroughly vindicated in, in, in their uh, uh, challenge on uh, the, the immoral, illegal, and unconstitutional aspects of the Vietnam War. These kinds of things, people who are on the left of the political uh, uh, spectrum, uh, who because they uh, challenge some of the policies of this country can be considered politically dangerous when the Constitution of the United States provides in its First and Fourth Amendments guarantees that people have a right to state their views. People have a right to congregate and to meet. And uh, uh, when these programs are designed in such a way to make people victims and criminals and subject to attack and abuse and harassment simply by exercising their... Uh, constitutional rights, that that flies in the face of what democratic society is all about. And I'm trying to say to people that while we are following the budgetary dollars, the critical and bottom line question that we must never forget is that these hearings are really about the question of freedom and whether or not these organizations that are ostensibly designed to protect and defend people's freedoms and civil liberties uh, have in fact thwarted their civil rights and civil liberties. And I think as we proceed through these hearings, we're going to uh, begin to see a pattern of electronic uh, technology so far advanced that it really in some ways would probably make the First and the Fourth Amendment totally obsolete. And I think this is horrifying and shocking, and, and I'm sure that we'll begin to move into this area even further, particularly when we begin to talk with the NSA. Okay, that's the first document you referred to this morning in the hearing. What else? <clears throat> One other document that I read from that's very brief and I could repeat it, it's a document that, that tries to point out that the FBI has hired a significant number of informants. And what I wanted to do was to focus for a moment on a case that I thought spoke to the use of funds, the method of operation, and the capability of auditing these kind of functions. I did not use names. The gentleman uh, from the FBI who was here, I'm certain, could have verified the uh, narrative that I tried to present. In the early 1970s, a former member of the Minutemen organization was recruited by an FBI informant, uh, as an FBI informant. He was the leader of a right-wing organization called the Secret Army Organization. The prime function of the informant was to surveil and harass activists. This is a political activist. While on the FBI payroll at $200 per month plus expenses, the informant participated in, and uh, this can be verified, bombings and burglaries. During one of the burglaries, a gun was stolen. Some days later, that gun was fired at the house of an activist, shattering the elbow of a young woman. The informant was in a car from which he, the gun was fired. The informant took the gun and gave it to his FBI contact. Now, this is a employee of the FBI, an agent of the FBI. The agent took the gun and hid it under his couch for six months until the um, SAO member who did the shooting was apprehended by local police. Now, the incident finally cost the agent his job. Um, and during the same period, this particular informant used money, at least indirectly, funded by the FBI to... Uh, uh, write up two interesting documents, one called booby traps, how to make booby traps, 
And number two, they developed at FBI expense a document called the use of uh, ammonium nitrate in high explosives. So you put that document out in the community and then begin to say to people, these are the kinds of things that the new left and the political activists in the country are doing in an effort to intimidate um, or bring fear on the part of many American people who would then say, well, these persons on the base of their political views are trying to blow up America. But when you start to filter through this process, you find out that FBI funds are used, given to an informant, to develop these kinds of documents and circulate them to discredit some other elements of our society. And what I'm saying is, again, that same pattern. Are our federal agencies set up to protect and defend people's rights, or are they set up in such a way to discredit and to harm? And for whose political interest? This is supposed to be a democracy, and we should have the ability to tolerate a full range of political views without going into these kinds of uh, absurd things. Ron, I believe you said uh, when you were asking these questions this morning that this happened in Berkeley. No, I didn't say that this happened in okay. Berkeley. Uh, what I want to get at is, it, so far as you can say, where this information is coming from. Is this coming to you as a congressman, as you are briefed for these hearings, or did this come from the FBI itself? Well, I have received material from persons who have been directly involved in these factors, people who have been on their own investigating these matters from private citizens, uh, from people who have made it their business over the past several years as sort of public advocate groups to study these agencies and to study abuses. And this is where I'm getting the information from. I would assume that people are giving us this information because they think we'll use it and try to use it as constructively and as effectively as we can in, in, in moving these hearings forward. When I mentioned in, uh, uh, with respect to one of my constituents, this was regarding a matter called uh, the Security Index where I received a communication uh, from one of my constituents who had gotten this material that a communication was made from the San Francisco office to Washington of the FBI, of the FBI saying that we would not at this particular moment uh, classify this person in such manner that they would end up on the security index, but we will send information later. So my question is, what is the security index? What is the authorization for this index? How do they fund this? And is this another way to further harass and intimidate American citizens without any justification, without any real documentation? And again, I think that this is potentially a very dangerous uh, kind of uh, uh, potential abuse in, in, in an open society. And so I use that letter simply to dramatize the point and to get them to respond in terms of what this program is, how it's funded, how it's authorized, et cetera. Do you think this index is going to be the FBI's equivalent of a Richard Nixon's enemy list or the CIA's list of domestic people involved in subversive activities? Well, no question. It comes from that. It, 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 it flows very smoothly from that same kind of mentality, which I think is very frightening. And certainly Watergate and the impeachment hearings are more than adequately and, and dramatically pointed out that when federal governmental agencies' power is unchecked, there's awesome potential for corruption, and that corruption can certainly abuse and harm and intimidate uh, many, many American citizens. And my only point is simply this. Is this a democracy or isn't it? And if it is, in fact, a democracy, then you've got to have the appropriate safeguards. If it's a convenient democracy, then let's say that to people and then let people decide whether they want to continue to live in those kind of conditions or whether they really want to see the kind of abuse on the part of governmental agencies uh, totally removed. And I think that that's the responsibility of this committee if we're diligent about our business. Okay, still another document you presented this morning. Yes, now, there was another document that I... Uh, where I read from an FBI memorandum dated 5-9-1960, uh, and this was uh, to Mr. Sullivan uh, from Mr. Brennan. Do you know who they are at all? No, I have to uh, check this out. I'm, I'm sure that they're top echelon people in the FBI. And the subject is counterintelligence program, internal security, disruption of the new left. And then I read uh, the first paragraph from this particular document, and... Uh, it says, and I quote, our nation is undergoing an era of disruption and violence caused to a large extent by various individuals generally connected with the new left. Some of these activities urge revolution in America and call for the defeat of the United States in Vietnam. They continually and falsely allege police brutality and do not 
hesitate to utilize unlawful acts to further their so-called causes. The new left has on many occasions viciously and scurrilously attacked the director of the FBI in an attempt to hamper our investigation of it and to drive us off the college campuses. With this in mind, it is our recommendation that a new counterintelligence program be designed to neutralize the new left and the key activists. The key activists are those individuals who are the moving forces behind the new left and, and uh, on whom we have intensified our investigations. And I just asked a simple rhetorical question. I wonder if this program was started because the director was called names. But more importantly, here again we find a lumping of people, the new left. So that means any person, any group, any individuals, uh, any collection of people who they define as new left may raise some very serious and important legitimate questions that have to be raised. You know, I've been defined as part of the new left, and I see myself as part of the new left thrust, but I am in no way an advocate uh, uh, of violence. So what we do is to lump all these persons uh, out there as a justification to take a whole group of people. It's like saying, you know, all blacks are lazy, or all Chicanos are this, or all Puerto Ricans are this, or all police are this, or all so-and-so are that. I think when you get into those kind of labels, there's awesome potential to abuse people. And so you take this kind of statement and you move against any organization that any informant or any agent or any person out there says is a new left group, you automatically say that equals danger, that equals violence, and then you justify a massive program to infiltrate these organizations, discredit these organizations, even in fact print leaflets and put their names on them and circulate them around campuses, around community, and then say to people, look, this is what these persons are doing. When you start to check back again, you find that these documents are funded. And I have uh, reams and reams of material here that can document very specific memorandums from various departments in the uh, FBI where they in fact said our program will be to print certain leaflets, to print certain documents and to circulate them around the community in an effort to discredit. Now what is the role of the government to do this? That's like um, planning uh, uh, evidence on a person and then arresting that person and say you're guilty of a crime. And I think that with agencies with this kind of power have to be checked. And so I raised this issue to try to dramatize that point and get the committee uh, going on looking at the whole issue of counterintelligence. And then I looked at another document and read from a document dated 3468 to all special agents in charge from the director of the FBI t entitled counterintelligence programs, black nationalist hate groups, racial intelligence and uh, I just read one part it said to prevent the rise of a messiah who could unify and electrify the militant black nationalist movement then they have several names but they blanked it out in the document that I was able to uh, look at it said blank might be such a messiah he is the uh, mortar of the movement that may be Malcolm X or so blank blank and blank all aspire to this position blank is less of a threat because of his age Blank would be a very real contender for this position should he abandon his supposed obedience to white liberal doctrines, nonviolence, and embrace black nationalism. Um, that may very well be, uh, say, Dr. Martin Luther King, who was an advocate of nonviolence. And they said, Blank has the necessary charisma to be a real threat in this way. Well, this is, this is supposed to be a free society. Blacks and browns and reds and yellows and whites are supposed to be able to live in this country. Now, during the civil rights era, people began to raise the issues of prejudice, discrimination, racism, and oppression. And, uh, and under the First Amendment to the Constitution, they have a right to raise these issues. And society needs to deal with those questions rather than to develop an entire program, you see, to prevent any kind of black person from rising to speak uh, as uh, with some authority and some effectiveness to the critical problems that confront blacks. Now, Ron, this is a document that was circulated, so far as you know, within the Justice Department or the FBI. Absolutely. And the date I noticed is about a month before Dr. Martin Luther King's death. Yes. Does that suggest anything to you? Well, it certainly suggests to me that, I, that one of the major responsibilities of this committee is certainly in our recommendations, because I don't think that between now and January 30th, this committee is either going to open up the Kennedy assassination or the King assassination issue. But it seems to me that we ought to learn enough. And if there's documentation that raises serious questions, and I think that the documentation exists, that w at least one of the recommendations ought to be that, that uh, the Congress of the United States demand a reopening of the entire Martin Luther King death. And I think we need to look very specifically at, at, at the frightening question of whether the government in any way 
through its intelligence or what have you, had the slightest thing to do with that. I have no way of answering that question at this particular moment, and I would not allege it, and I think at this particular moment certainly would be irresponsible. But I think that when you look at how short a time this was, it certainly requires that we raise this question. I characterize this kind of thing as racist and extremely dangerous, and it should be appalling to all people when you engage in such things as racial intelligence, using taxpayers' money to, to, to do these kinds of things. Uh, the era that we went through in the civil rights movement raising these issues, America s survived that. And it seems to me that it would be a hell of a lot stronger if we began to deal with the issues raised by the persons out there who were uh, feeling the pain of uh, racism rather than spending money to go out there and oppress them. I think if you spend money to solve the problems that people raised, the poverty and hunger and disease, rather than spending millions of dollars in, in these kind of cloak and dagger programs that uh, that in my estimation fly in the face of what our principles are all about would be a better utilization of our time. And then uh, I went on to ask a series of questions that I think are, are rather important. Uh, for example, does the FBI have an intelligence or counterintelligence program presently underway? If so, what are they? Did the FBI have a counterintelligence program to attempt to pit the Black Panthers against organized crime? What's that about, Ron? Well, we are just now beginning to receive some information that at least it was discussed in the COINTELPRO program with an effort to try to infiltrate the, the, uh, uh, the, the Black Panther Party and sort of try to uh, direct it uh, toward uh, organized crime, you know, for example, uh, drug, drug traffic and, and, and these kinds of things.